All right, good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, my name is Danae Aber. I'm the executive director of the Louisiana Rural Health Association. Thank you so much for joining us for the Rural Infection Prevention and Control Training Program webinar today. Uh, we are very happy to present this program and this webinar series with sponsorship from Well Ahead Louisiana and in partnership with Southern Evals. Today's session is the Rural Health Clinic's Basics of Infection Prevention and Control. The advanced version of this webinar will be held on August 30th, so please be sure to visit our website and register for that session. I will put the uh, direct link to the webpage in the chat in a minute. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started here. The webinar is being recorded. It will be available along with a copy of the slides on our website um, on that same web page. Your line should have been muted automatically when you join the session. Please remain on mute until you're asked to speak or until we reach the Q&A portion so we prevent background noise throughout. After the webinar, I'm gonna send you a, an email that will include, um, again, the link to the website letting you know that the recording is live um, there will also be a link to a brief survey in that email. We do please ask that you complete that survey. Uh, it is required for our grant evaluation and it helps us to make sure we continue to improve our education at future events. And so with that, I would like to welcome Matt Sigler. He's the Chief Operating Officer and Senior Consultant at Southern Evals. Matt is a board, cert board certified with uh, the NARHC and has a track record of success with RHC initial and ongoing licensing and accreditation surveys. So thank you so much, Matt, for being here today. And I'm going to hand it off to you. Absolutely, absolutely. How's everybody doing this morning? I hope everybody's having a great day. We're going to get through this. It won't be too long. We're going to go into some, some kind of high level stuff, nothing too crazy. Um, get into you know infection control in the RHC setting. Of course, most of you probably know there's not a lot in that in that bag, but we'll unpack it as best we can. So we're gonna go ahead and get rolling with everything. As soon as I can get my slide to move. All right, guys, so we'll start off today. We kind of give some more shout outs. I'd like to see kind of who is in the crowd today, who we've got out there. Miss Dana Haynes, let's see if I can unmute. Danae, can you help me unmute Dana, uh, Dana Haynes? Just kind of tell me a little bit about yourself, where you come from and... Okay, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Right. I am at Minden Medical Center right here in Minden, and I'm hospital based, but we do have rural health clinics, so I'm just excited to learn more. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Very nice to meet you. What about Mr. James Blankenship? How you doing, Mr. James? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, can't complain. Can't complain. Where are you from? Oh, lost you there. Louisiana, the Southern Regional. Oh, okay, cool. Very nice to meet you. All right, let's see. We'll do one more. Let's see. Richard Hinton, Mr. Richard. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, Mr. Richard. How are you doing this morning? I'm great, sir. How are you doing, Jay? Uh, Matthew? Oh, uh, can't complain. I'm from Rees Memorial Medical Center. I'm the IP for both. The, it's a critical access hospital, but we have a rural health clinic also. So I'm kind of filling both hats here. I understand, I understand. Awesome, well, welcome, welcome this morning. Well, cool guys. Well, like I said, keep it kind of short. We wanna introduce to you folks and, and keep things rolling. Um, obviously, you know, infection control has been quite the roller coaster ride this past two years. It's been interesting with the pandemic, Lord knows it's been been kind of fun. Um, when you get into the rural health clinic setting though, it, it, it makes it a little bit more challenging. And we've been working in that sector for quite a while now. But before we get into that, I'd like to give you a little information on who we are. So Southern Evals is a regulatory compliance firm. Uh, we're Central Louisiana. We're based right out of Pineville. We specialize in, in regulatory compliance work, everything from clinic development all the way up to um, large medical facilities, joint commission prep, kind of you name it, anything kind of in that sector. Um, my wheelhouse specifically is RHCs, and I've been working in that probably the last six years now. Um, and we've kind of taken best practices over the years and have, have molded things. So the, what we're about to go through is not necessarily driven by the regs because there's not a whole lot in infection control for the RHC setting, but more or less best practices and kind of what we like to see in facilities or would like to see kind of moving forward, especially post pandemic, because there's been a lot of, of gaps identified. Um, in the last few years, especially. 
So we're gonna get into some of the basics here. So three P's, obviously, you know, you've gotta have your paperwork. You've gotta have your policies, procedures. You gotta have your practice. Without those three things, you have nothing. You've got no no plan. You, anybody who's been through survey knows you've got to have all those things in place. You've got to evidence your work. Nine times out of 10, you know, most times we're doing the work we're supposed to be doing, but we have to have, have the paperwork to back that. Um, make sure you have your policies, procedures, your evaluations, and those types of things just to showcase our excellence in, in rural health and, and, and the things that we do. So obviously, you know, obviously you can make a difference. You're the frontline worker there. You are the one the patient is seeing. They're coming to you at their worst point nine times out of 10. And so we want to make sure we do the best we can to help them out in all sectors, not just in infection control. So we'll start out with the paperwork part and kind of dive into those pieces there. Um, RHC Bible, this is what I call the policy and procedure manual, whether you use just the good old binder with all of your policies and procedures, um, all of your Things like that, or you use some of the maybe the newer digital platforms. If you're integrated into the hospital with but maybe an internet system with all your policies, that's your Bible. And you've got to make sure you've got your policies and procedures in place to make sure that you can evidence again the excellent work that you're doing. Um, with this uh, pandemic, obviously, we've seen big issues with making sure you've got everything lined out. So your COVID, what's your screening procedures? What is, what are all of your, uh, your checkoffs there? Are you screening your staff? Is it in writing? Do you have that there? What about your vaccinations? Um, are your, your exemptions and, and all of that? So there's a lot of stuff that you made to make sure you have in your RHC Bible, your policy procedure manual to make sure that you cover all your bases there. Like I said, a lot of these places, a lot of y'all are, are already doing it, but having it there just to, to make sure you're, you're rocking and rolling. Some of the other things we look for um, would, is, is program plan. So this is something that's kind of more familiar in the hospital setting. And we try to implement this into, into our clinic. So we wanna develop that program plan. We wanna have those risk assessments and goals. We wanna evaluate the program, very similar to your, your annual evaluation you do for your normal RHC, but with a focus on infection control. Based on those evaluations and risk assessments, we want to have our policies and procedures generated. What's our what's our biggest risk factor? What maybe it's maybe what is is most um, common in our parish? What is something that we need to kind of prepare for? Um, obviously, any kind of infection control logs. If you're track if you're tracking anything, um, maybe you're making hand hygiene rounds. Maybe you're checking mask compliance if that's part of your policy. Any of those types of things, and then wrapping that all into a quality program, so you can really determine like, hey, we need to do some 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 PDCAs to, uh, to improve in some areas, or maybe we're doing excellent here, or we're hitting some indicators, and we really need to to reshift focus because we we don't want to keep hitting one hundred percent on the same thing over and over again. Let's find a new place to work on those things, and that all is part of that RHC infection control bible. There, that's that's that really is the is the the meat of of what you're doing. Oh, let's see. So obviously we've covered the big three. We got program plan, the risk assessment, and the program evaluation. Getting into the program plan. This is just where the clinic provide evidence that it's developed the general infection control policy and procedures. Um, and we base those off of evidence, you know, evidence-based um, best practice. Um, you can do policies kind of bulked all like one big giant run on policy, depending upon your needs. I would probably suggest, you know, separating those out, having more than one policy to kind of encompass those things. Um, it just looks a little bit more comprehensive that way. You can kind of delve into things a little bit better. And it's not just one massive policy. It's just kind of a giant run on sentence. Um, let's see. You can make sure you update those things annually, um, and, and you want to be constantly aware of that, and especially wrapping it in with your annual evaluation, your advisory board meeting, governing board meetings, all those types of things. Um, just keeping that on the forefront there. Program plan is going to uh, identify the authority and responsibilities of the individual in control of the program, whether that's an ICP, if you're if you're provider based. Um, if you're in a freestanding clinic, that may be your office manager or whoever the, the, the practitioner deems to be that individual. It, it really is, is whoever you want to put there. Um, but you need to make sure when doing that, we also identify our reporting methodologies. Um, we cover employee health. So what does that look like? You know, are we checking vaccine status? Are we um, going through uh, hep B, TB testing, all those things? Are we analyzing our patient population for any kind of outbreaks, any kind of influxes of diseases and stuff like that? If, if we're in a, in a problem-ridden area, if we know it's, it's common to see 
on a TV. Are we seeing an uptick in that? God forbid we don't see an uptick in TV. But um, you know, what's your surveillance plan? How are you evaluating your plan? What are your annual goals? What references are you using for those, those best practices? Those all go into your program plan and, and really developing the meat of what you're, you're trying to do. Risk assessment, obviously, this kind of is where we're, we're analyzing, again, your regional risk factors, and we score them. We put them to a score. It's similar to what you would see for like a, a, a hazard vulnerability analysis for emergency preparedness, very similar style layout there. Um, so you go through uh, as a facility, you determine like what's, what's our biggest risk factors here, and you score those things. And based on your scores, how you develop, you know, you prioritize your, your, your list there. Um, again, obviously, we keep everything very simple. We don't want anything overcomplicated because if it's overcomplicated, odds are we're probably not going to do it, right? Yeah, let's be honest. Day to day struggle, it's a lot. It's been a lot the last two years. Everybody is is definitely jumping through a lot of hoops, wearing a lot of hats, trying to make sure things continue to flow well. So we want to keep things simple so it's not just so cumbersome to get these things done. We want to make sure we're providing the highest quality care, but at the same time, not bogging you down with, with a million things to do paperwork wise. Um, your risk assessment is going to have those key components that you need to include in your RHC, right? So you, if you're doing things like diabetic foot care, wound care, any of those things, are you separating your sick and well waiting areas? Um, any kind of scenario like that, are you processing instruments? Lord knows autoclaves can be a bit of a nightmare at times if you're not following all the steps core to manufacturer's guidelines. Um, and and those those types of things can get a clinic in a real bind during survey time. So it's makes it's really a good idea to, to identify all of those all those things, look at your clinic, look at your practice, look at your day to day and, and really line out what you need to do and then kind of wrap it all in together. Let's see, turn the chat, show you the chat previews. Danae on this, I'm sorry, pause everything, guys. Do you want me to jump in and answer questions or do you want to save questions to the end? That's completely up to you. Okay, let's see real quick. Uh, question, do you need a separate plan and manual for the clinic and hospital if both are affiliated? As long as you have everything built into your, your plan and you show where you have that oversight at Mr. Provider-Based Clinic, correct? Mr. Richard, I believe that is. Um, as long as the provider-based clinic, you show that integration, you address the clinics specifically in that. I don't see any problems with that being in there. I think that'd be perfectly fine. But I would definitely make sure that when you identify those um, you make sure the clinic is held out separately so it can be easily identified. So when you have that on, on site for surveyors, they can, you know, make sure that all that's all taken care of there. Cool. Let me slide this over to the side. All right. Risk assessment narrative. So this is getting into, um, you have, we had the risk assessment chart, which is identifying specific risk factors to our facility. The narrative is going to look at things like your community, community demographics. It's going to look at local patterns of diseases, which is what we kind of discussed earlier. Um, your TB parish profile, national concerns, obviously COVID is going to be on there, possibly monkeypox if it continues to grow. Um, patient factors, what's your community at risk for? What, what is their, their health status there? Um, do you have a younger population? Do you have an elderly population? Those things kind of all play a factor in that as well. Then you're going to look at surveillance and identified risks. Um, and then you're going to prioritize your risk and, and, and help to develop some goals there. You're going to want to develop goals obviously that are applicable to your to your clinic and your in your your community so risk assessment chart we kind of went over this a while ago as where you're picking out all of your things it's based off the previous years and opinions where you're going to analyze um what's happened like this obviously this past year COVID is going to be number one on everybody's list if it's not, then we got problems. Um, you know, what, what's happened over the over the last year or two? What's the severity of it? How well, well were we prepared? How well did we get prepared, you know, in consecutive years? Look at those things. You can see the tracking and trending there too. Um, and then obviously you want to rank those priorities to create your goals um, accordingly. Then you get into the risk assessment piece. This is where you're developing your goals. So you need to make smart goals that are specific, especially measurable goals. Um, you want to make sure they're obviously very attainable, they're very relevant, and they're very time-based. Because if you, it's it's great to create goals, but if they're very ambiguous goals that you don't, you're not able to quantify, then it's hard to to meet those goals and and show true success in meeting those things. So we want to make sure, like, 
um, if we, we're isolating, we're, we're taking all precautions to prevent COVID spread throughout the clinic. Uh, maybe we're tracking you know, COVID infections um, with staff, or maybe we're checking um, environmental rounds and we're looking for a certain level of compliance with, with the actual facility itself. Maybe we're looking at mass compliance and if that's a part of our, our day to day and, and how compliant are we making somebody like, um, like a secret shopper style setup. You pick a staff member to kind of walk around and they, they do the you know, mask audits or hand hygiene audits, making sure we're washing our hands at all the appropriate moments. And then if you're not doing that education and stuff to support this. And so this thing really gives you your goals, your objectives, and your strategies um, to help you meet those goals and objectives. Program evaluation is going to be key with all of this. So once we get, you know, our risk assessment and we get our chart and our narrative and things put together, your program evaluation after you've done that, after you put all these things together is going to measure your, your success. So you want to make sure that you evidence all the things you put in place. Um, you want to look back at all the stuff you've done the previous year. What could we have done better? What could, what did we do really great on? You know, what's something that, you know, how do we tweak those things? How do we modify those goals? How do we uh, um, evaluate where we really need to make you know, improvements and stuff like that. Um, I think there's anything else in the chat with you on that one. Sorry. Uh, I think that pretty wraps, pretty much wraps it up there on that one. It's, it's really looking at like the quality metrics. You, you can get your, you go with your goals from the risk assessment chart and you can quantify those things. You know, did we, let's say our, our annual mass compliance was 90%. That's fantastic. We need to continue on. Let's say we get to 95%. Say your hand hygiene's hanging low around 80%. Let's set a new goal, right? When we do our program evaluation, we want to set that goal. I want 95% or higher you know, percentage of compliance with hand hygiene. And then you kind of adjust accordingly from there. I believe this is kind of what we've already, already been discussing. Um, kind of got a little bit ahead of myself. So again, you want to make sure you use this data um, to to evaluate where you are, where you are, what you're doing, and and how to adjust for future goals as well. Then we get into the policy and procedures. The policy and procedures are going to be built off of all the things that you had discovered in your in your evaluations, in your risk assessments, and those types of things. Um, there's a little bit in the standards. There's not a ton in, in RHC standards like you would see in, in a hospital setting. Obviously, hospitals have tons and tons of regulations with respect to infection control, whether it be through CMS, LDH, or if you're accredited through Joint Commission, any of those bodies there. Um, but some of the big things, obviously, in RHCs, you obviously want to have a very clean and orderly premise. We want to make sure that the facility is organized. We have clean and dirty areas properly labeled. It's not nasty. It's not dusty. There's not bugs. There's not any of those types of things. So infection control in the RHC is going to really encompass everything from environment and care to medication management a little bit, in, in addition to just traditional infection control, just hand hygiene, those kind of things. Um, the big thing is wanting to make sure you have a cleaning schedule, you have housekeeping. What are you doing in those scenarios, right? Are you, do you have a log do you keep track of those things? Um, do we utilize safe injection practices um, as far as like sharps containers? And are we, are we keeping those things locked up against the wall? Are we, are we maintaining that stuff right? Um, any type of renovation, remodeling? Um, it, it's more for hospitals kind of setting is, is making sure you have those areas completely carved off. Um, there's a more of a focus in that setting, but anytime you do construction, if you're doing remodeling, you want to make sure you block that stuff off. Um, you want to make sure that you don't have dust flowing. If you're doing a drywall, be mindful of patients and those kind of things. It's not a, not a whole lot more to go into on that side. Um, hand hygiene obviously should be number one priority on everybody's list. Anytime you're working in, healthcare sector or just in life in general. Um, definitely want to make sure you're washing your hands, you know, before patient contact, after patient contact, you know, if time you're going to come in contact with possibly with bodily fluids, um, after you're removing your gloves, obviously you want to encourage either soap and water or the alcohol hand solutions. Um, alcohol hand solutions are always fantastic, except for when our hands are visibly sold. We want to make sure that we, we do use that soap and water. Um, Obviously, bloodborne path, 
excuse me, bloodborne pathogens. We want to make sure we, we limit exposure there. We want to make sure we have our spill kits. We want to make sure the staff can properly identify where your PPE is located. Um, you want to make sure that you have uh, just a plan in place and that your team is aware of the plan if something were to occur, because it's all well and good to have an exposure control plan or spill kits or PPE. But if you don't talk to your staff about how to use it, where to, you know, when to use it, then it does us no good. So making sure we have all those things kind of wrapped up into your training and into your your, your orientation for your clinic is, is key there. Um, and again, that kind of wraps it all. It's all kind of intertwined. Make sure with, with those things, you have a good cleaning schedule. Make sure you have, you know, all those things in place to keep a good orderly clinic. Disinfection and sterilization. These... Ooh, these can get you in a bind in the clinic setting. Lord knows, I know rural America is very, very, um, very frugal when it comes to certain scenarios. Uh, Lord, you, we've seen some things. We've seen some instruments disinfected in in, in quite a few interesting ways. Uh, but making sure you're following those autoclaves, uh, making sure you follow your manufacturer guidelines, making sure that the processes and procedures you have in place are based off of those manufacturer guidelines. I can't encourage you enough to make sure you're doing your culture testings, uh, make sure you're sending all those reports off, making sure you're keeping a log of, of your autoclave, your instruments, make sure you've got your biomarkers and those such things if you use an autoclave. Obviously, outside of this world and as a consultant, I recommend everybody use disposable. It just cuts down a ton of headache and a ton of, of trouble. Um, but if you're going to use those, that's fantastic. Some clinics I know send their stuff off to the hospital, cuts out all the headache, and they still get to use their, their insurance as well. But big thing there, the big take on there is making sure you use utilize the manufacturer's guidelines. You have proper ways of labeling dirty instruments and transporting them to and from clean you, the autoclave to get them disinfected properly. Obviously, this is this goes back into keeping a clean building. This is environment and care, right? We want to make sure that we're cleaning the, the exam rooms uh, properly. We make sure that our staff are aware of our kill times or our, our wet times or our dry times and our wipes. Make sure that they can speak to those things. Because when surveyors make their rounds, they're going to be asking your staff, like, what, what, what is your kill time? What is your wet time? They're going to want to see your room turnover process. Um, and does your room turnover process make sense? Um, I like to go through clinics and, and, and suggest that when you have your beds and your exam rooms that we don't keep paper on the beds after we've cleaned it. So when you go through that survey, after that room has been dirty, you tear your paper off, you wipe your bed down, you let it stay wet for your two minutes or three minutes, whatever it may be, and you cleanly, you've, you've turned that room over properly. And that way, when you explain that process one time to your, to your surveyor, as they're walking through your clinic and they see a room that's got no paper on the bed, they know that that's a clean room. And if there's paper on the bed, then they know that that's a dirty room. And that room needs to be wiped down. I can't tell you how many times, and I'm those kind of patients, when I walk into a room, I'm not getting on that bed unless I have to. So you have a patient that may not get on the bed. Well, we want to make sure that we, we, we clean that bed anyway and take care of those things. Um, and that all comes down to the, to your cleanliness and, and sanitation in the clinic. And you can wrap that into other spaces as well, like with your break rooms and your just your countertops and those types of scenarios. It's all it's very good to have those those processes and stuff lined out. The easiest thing to do, though, is having your staff be well aware of what your kill times are. You know, encouraging them to wipe those services down. I know it can take some time. I know when days get hectic, we're seeing, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 patients a day. It gets a little bit crazy in the clinic setting, but taking that time is going to be a big deal to help, you know, really improve the, the cleanliness of the clinic. Um, obviously, medical waste disposal, we want to make sure all of our red bags is all of our biohazards put in red bags. We want to make sure that's all done properly. We want to make sure that if we're you know, transporting those things, we're very careful with that. We're not getting any kind of medical waste um, or we're contaminating any additional services. We want to make sure we get those things to that biohazard closet and we're removing those from that to get it to the medical waste team that's going to dispose of those things that we do so in a very, very quick um, and, and secure method, right? Um, so that's going to get into all your things like your sharps containers, your red bag waste is going to get to your PPE and disposal, uh, disposable items and how you dispose of those things properly and making sure you spend the time to 
get rid of those things appropriately. You don't want to walk into a room where you've got sharps containers overflowing, or you've got a biohazard room where things are just kind of thrown in, or you're storing cleaning supplies or, you know, like toilet paper in your biohazard closet. You want to make sure that there's proper storage of those things, keeping them separate and distinct from one another is, is a big deal as well. Pest control. Um, can't can't emphasize that enough. I can't tell how many times we've gone through places and we pop open a drawer and and maybe we're in the kitchen, there's ants, or maybe we're somewhere in the, and you see some more of the other types of pests. So in, making sure you have, have a pest control agreement, um, making sure you have that taken care of to make sure you don't have any type of infestations in, inside your clinic is, is, a, is a big ordeal. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the all the other little verbiage on that there. It's kind of self-explanatory as far as that's concerned, um, but making sure those clinics are taken care of, making sure that you have no surprises, that your clinic is clean and orderly is, is, a, is a big deal. Reportable diseases. So obviously we look at the state, we look at see what you have to have, keep a copy of the reportable diseases in your clinic where it's easily, easily, um, available to your staff. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else to hit on that. Uh, develop a relationship with your local sanitarian. Obviously, everybody's got a sanitarian that should be coming to visit you annually to come do your, your annual inspections. Build a rapport with those people. Talk to them. See what they can help you with. Maybe they've got some new data out. Maybe they've got an updated list. Maybe they've changed sanitarians and we need to be in contact with them. Make sure we have that relationship there in place with them. Um, so we can we can have that 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 continuity in the, in the community there. Um, knowing which diseases to report is big. Knowing when you need to call and all those pieces. Sorry, I've got my my screen there in the way. Um, employee health, obviously, employee health is a big one. We want to make sure that we've got you know are we screening our new hires. Are we um, doing TB questionnaires for those folks who've been there for over a year? You know, do we have our Hep B? Is all that proof of vaccination or declinations? Is that in our employee files? Um, obviously, COVID vaccinations is a hot topic item right now. We want to make sure that we've got either proof of our vaccinations or we've got our exemption documentation. All that's current and in the folder. When your when your surveyors come out and about, they're going to be looking for those types of things to see you know, are you doing all the things you need to do? So we need to make sure that's the three big ones, COVID vaccine, uh, hepatitis B, and TB, either, this, either the screening or the, the questionnaire. I want to make sure those are in your employee files. A lot of our hospital clinics, I don't have to worry about those too much because usually HR has that locked down. Some of our independent clinics, sometimes it's a little more difficult to keep all those things, you know, on top of, on top of the list to keep it done because we're, we're trying to run everything and take care of patients and, and provide them good quality care. And sometimes the day to day gets, gets out of, out of hand, but that's a big one to make sure we have in our employee files there. All right, sharp safety. Um, some big items to be aware of. Obviously, we want to make sure we're disposing of our sharps appropriately. We want to make sure, you know, basic sharps handling. We want to make sure needles for only one patient. We're only using, you know, single use items there. Obviously, we're not going to be reusing sharps. Um, we want to make sure we dispose of those things properly. We want to make sure that we, when, with proper disposal, we um, aren't overloading our sharps containers. We don't want to have any needle sticks and those types of things. Um, with needle sticks, we want to make sure we do have a procedure in place. What do we do in the case of a needle stick? How do we handle those scenarios? You know, what's what's what needs to be taken care of for that staff member or, or any, anything along those lines immediately after that incident? Um, and we want to make sure that we don't um, we're not reusing we're not reusing single dose vials as multi dose vials. I don't know a single accreditor that wouldn't lose their mind um, if they found single single dose vials being utilized as multi dose vials. Uh, that's a big no no. We need to be make sure we're labeling those vials appropriately when we do pop those caps. We want to make sure that you've got it dated and initial and you're ready to discard within that twenty eight to thirty days. Um, but the big again, the big thing is making sure we have all those things in place. Make sure we have a policy on it. Make sure it's it's in writing so we can support our good practice. 
Um, you want to make sure your sharps containers are secured properly and in in reasonable locations where you're not having to walk with with you know use needles or something like that along the way. Keep it where you're going to be administering those medications and stuff like that. Um, same as your point of care testing areas, you want to make sure that you've got the proper um, equipment there to discard those um, those waste items appropriately to cut down any type of exposure risk as much as possible. Um, obviously, transmission-based precautions is a big thing. We want to make sure that our staff can identify the differences between standard precautions and contact precautions and droplet precautions and airborne precautions. With that being said, we want to make sure not only that, we want to make sure we have the proper PPE for our staff and they need and they need to know when to implement that proper PPE. They need to know about, you know, when you have contact precautions um, versus versus airborne precautions and those types of things. The difference is in just a regular mask versus an N95 mask. Um, that's a big thing. Obviously, everybody needs to know. Um, where that's all located and when they need to get a mask, especially with with COVID like it is and all the things that's going along with that. Housekeeping, I kind of touched on this earlier, but how to properly clean a room, how to turn one over, um, how to identify a clean room. Again, I, I like to see a room that's got no paper on the bed for it being identified as clean. Um, but again, follow your local, follow your procedures, what works best for your staff. It doesn't have to be the way I said it, it could be whatever works best for you guys. And as long as you can evidence those things and you can speak to it, that's a big deal. So making sure that the staff understand their kill times and dry times and those types of things and can speak to that is going to be the biggest thing when you come to your housekeeping. COVID-19 policies. This has obviously been a big one. Um, you need to make sure you've got your COVID-19 plan and policies and procedures based off CDC guidance to keep in place in the clinic. It's app's going to identify your procedures. So your screening, what are your temp checks looking at? What are you doing with staff? Um, how are you handling your, um, your exemptions? Um, what requirements do you have in the workplace if you're going to be exempt? Uh, are they are you mandating that they wear an N95? Are you mandating that they wear a, a surgical mask? Um, if someone's exposed, what are what what processes and procedures do you have in place to support your stuff? Um, the big thing is making sure we stay up with CDC guidance. And I know there for a while it sounded like it changed every 30 seconds and you're writing a new policy. And as soon as you got it finalized, you were changing it again. It seems like things have kind of slowed down a bit with that. Um and seems like mask regulations have kind of started dialing back as well. Um, so hopefully things start to kind of go a little bit back to normal, but we'll, we'll obviously kind of follow it and see. I think COVID is going to be with us for a while. So I'm sure there'll be a ramp up as we get back into kind of the cooler weather, kind of in the flu season again, we'll see those things. So pop up again. So the big thing is making sure you have your policies and procedures in place with your, again, your plans, your, what you're doing for vaccinated folks, your screening and your temp checking and all those things, your mask compliance, your hand hygiene compliance, and just your generalized workplace guidelines. That's a big thing. A couple of reminders. This is just some reminders from the upcoming webinars. Um, Danae, I think we're just about to the end, if I remember correctly. Yes. All right, Danae. Thanks, Matt. Oh, sorry. Now I'm unmuted. <laughs> now you can hear me. Um, thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us today. I'm going to launch a quick poll here. If you would take that for us, just a little quick eval. Um, as I mentioned, uh, a recording will be available on our website in the next couple of days. I'm going to send um, an email with the link when it's live along with the survey. Um, make sure that you register for the advanced webinar that is coming in August. Um, and you can see the um, application here on the screen is for the on-site assessment and education. Um, so please apply for that um, as soon as possible. That closes um, on July 1 and I will post the direct link to that uh, in the chat box here in just a moment. Awesome. And I didn't ask if, if anybody had any questions. I mean, feel free. I know I talk kind of fast, so <laughs> I 
I, I kind of get on the road. It's hard to hard to gauge it when you can't see anybody and there's no feedback right there. Um, so anybody got any questions? Let's see. No. All right. Good deal. All right. Well, if there's no questions, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And um, like I said, uh, you should receive an email from me in the next couple of days with the link and the recording. Uh, make sure that you apply for the on-site assessment by Friday. It'll close on Friday. And I hope everyone has a wonderful long weekend for 4th of July. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Y'all have a good one.